Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, where we believe that everyone is creative, but smart, creative people don't go it alone. I'm Laura Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell. And we are creativity coaches who help people fear less, create more, and bring their creative visions to life. If you are an OG member of the Spark File community, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, what? Welcome, friend. Know that just by listening to this podcast, you're joining a warm and wonderful clan of creatives. But hold up. You may be asking yourself, what exactly is a spark file? A spark file is a place where you consistently collect all your inspirations and fascinations. If you're like us and you're making stuff all the time or you want to be making stuff all the time, you know, if you're not careful, your campfire of creativity can flicker out. But don't despair. We're collecting kindling in the form of fresh ideas, images, and inspiration that spark creativity and peak curiosity. To light a fire under our collective asses to make things like this podcast. Or several open water extreme endurance swims that blow minds, break records, and amplify peace. Or a strong body and stronger mind that can do remarkable things. Or a whole series of books and keynotes that take readers along on extraordinary real-life aquatic and creative adventures. On today's Maker Sode, we're going to talk with someone who... Oh, truly sparks us. And that someone is extreme endurance swimmer, author, speaker, and human spark, Lynn Cox. Lynn, welcome to the The Spark 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 File. File. Lynn, I'm so happy to be with you today. (laughs) Well, Lynn, we are so thrilled that you are joining us today. Sparklers, you may recall back in 2019, I shared a spark on this very podcast about Lynn Cox and her book entitled Grayson. I'm getting chills just saying this. Mm -hmm. Uh, This this book is wonderful. And it's about her five hour encounter with a baby whale that had been separated from its mama in the open waters off the coast of Southern California. If you haven't listened to that episode, you might want to go back. And listen to it or not, you do you. But Lynn, it is such a joy and an honor to have you here. We are so sparked by your work as an athlete and as a creative. And we just want to thank you uh, for sharing your time with us and our listeners. I'm so happy to be here and to talk to you. I'm looking (laughs) forward to it. It's great. Oh, thank you so much. Lynn, we always start with the basics. Where are you right now? And how are you right now for reals? I am doing things that I've never done before, and Ooh. I love to do that. It, pretty much in my work is, is what I'm doing. The, the thing about what I do really is, is writing and swimming, and the swimming is about trying things I've never done before, 
extending out further, pushing borders and boundaries and seeing what's capable. And the other part is my writing. And the biggest thing for me is that whenever I write a book, it's never like the one I've written before. Uh So creatively, I'm taking a huge risk because I'm not sure my audience is going to follow along with me. And, and, And I don't know how I will be received with what I write. So that sense of success that you might have when you finish a channel swim and know that you reach the shore may not be there with the writing. But I write because I feel like I want to say something. I want to explore something. I want to do something new. I don't want to repeat what I've done before. And I think that that whole thing inspires me to try something new. And and from everything from let me try this new weird food. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Or let me go to this new interesting place and learn from somebody. And so I think that that's what really inspires me. And I hope that somebody else will take it and use it for what they want to do. Well, it sounds like your readers have to be up for that adventure rather than like, oh, I know what I can expect from Lynn every single book. Instead of that, it's, oh, wow, what's Lynn up to now? What are we trying now? What are we learning now? It's something new. I really wish that people thought like that, all people, but I think there are people that are really creative and that there are other people that want, expect what they want and they only want that. So I'm really lucky though, because the people in the past who have read my books, a lot of them are people that are seeking adventure, that are seeking yes. things, that are pushing themselves. Yes. So when I do book signings, the people that show up, like have one of my favorite memories is I was doing a book signing at the New York Public Library, and there were a group of swimmers that came in that were soaking wet. And they said, we're really sm- sorry we smell like the East River, but we wouldn't be able to get fast <laughs> enough here by roads so we swam across to the library. And Amazing. I just thought, this is the funniest thing. These, these are, are your people. people. <laughs> these, are, these are my people. These are the people that I write for. And, you know, it's sort of every time I meet up with them, they have their own stories of wild things that they've done. And that in turn spy- inspires the group. But it also makes me think that, wow, maybe I should be doing something more. I don't know. I feel like we're going to get into it in a bit, but the breadth of the things that you're doing, I'm sort of like, it seems like a great creative life well lived even thus far. And I'm sort of like, I guess you could do more. I guess you could pursue your pastry chef career and you could, but it just seems like you do so much. Um, But it also, what you're saying leads to and our next question, which is the Spark File price of admission, you refer to this, but can you tell us a specific creative risk that you have taken recently? This sounds like such a little thing, but it was such a big thing for me recently. And I, it was through my swimming. My friend Kent and I decided to go swimming one morning because that's what we do as our routine. And suddenly the fog came in. And I've been lost at midnight on a channel swim across the Catalina Channel. So that was a big, fearful thing. And so I was looking at this fog moving in thinking, is it worth this risk or not? And how can we do this safely if we're going to do it? Yeah. So what we did was do it as safely as possible. But there was still this uncertainty of, are we going to have a problem? And the biggest thing was not getting lost in the fog, but it was that we couldn't see the rowers that were coming across the water. Oh, yes. So we had to change the whole way of our swimming. We had to swim head up. We had to listen. We had to take our goggles off and just stare into the sunny fog, you know, wow. which is almost worse because everything's so bright. You, can, you can't see more than 50 meters. And th- usually you need to see 200 meters to be able to get through an area where the rowers are without being hit by them. So we made it across and it was not the smartest thing to do, (laughs) but it made me feel like, well, we got in a good workout. (laughs) (laughs) Using all your senses. Yeah, exactly. Because that was really it, that you had to be so in tune to the water and to the environment and everything going on to make sure that you didn't get hit. But a little disclaimer, too, is a few days, well, probably a few weeks before, there was another situation where the visibility was not great because it was raining, Uh starting to rain. And so 
we had figured out how to navigate that area. And I yelled out a few times to warn a rower that there was a swimmer out there and he heard us. So, you know, there was some risk, but at the same time, I don't usually take risks when I'm in the water. Um, Just because things can, once you start things going wrong, they can go wrong really fast. Yeah. Um, But this was, this was okay. Glad to hear that. We do talk (laughs) about creative risks on this, on this podcast and how it sometimes feels like it can be life or death stakes, you know, just any kind of creative risk. Yours actually were life or death stakes. So happy that the ending, (laughs) positive ending, and you're here with us today. No, it wasn't, it wasn't life and death, but it's, but it's having had that fear of being lost in the fog from that really bad situation before. And to say, I'm not going to limit it now. I'm not going to change my life because what something happened when I was 17 years old. That's right. I'm going to go ahead and go forward. And how can we do this and do it in a safe way? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm teasing you, but, no. <laughs> but genuinely like overcoming a fear, that's a, that's big yeah. to, to rewrite the ending of that very old narrative in your mind. It's beautiful and safe to say you are officially admitted into the spark file. <laughs> You're qualified. <laughs> You're qualified. So for people who don't know you, when people ask, what do you do? How do you answer that question? When your husband introduces you. It depends on who we're with, but often he'll say she's an athlete who has broken 60 world records and and broke the men's women's world record when she was 15 and 16. He will say that I'm an author and I'm a New York Times bestselling author. He'll brag about me. And then um, he'll also say that I'm a, a speaker, a corporate speaker. So I feel like I'm those things, but I'm more than that. You know, I'm a friend. I'm a, a yeah. person who, you know, loves to be with other people. I, you know, there's, there's, those are just little titles that somewhat describe who I am and what I want to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Lynn, as your husband was bragging about you, you have accomplished so much as an athlete and a creative and a human. It's hard to know what to ask you first. So we're going to begin with your accomplishments as an athlete. You have set so many records. You have tackled so many firsts. Here are just a few of your accomplishments as a swimmer and strap in folks, because this is going to take a moment to list these remarkable accomplishments. Hit it, Laura. I'll start. In 1971, at the age of 14, you were the youngest person to swim the Catalina Channel. You and a group of friends trained for a year, and then you all swam 27 miles in 12 hours and 36 hours minutes. At 15, you swam across the English Channel in nine hours and 57 minutes, breaking the men's world record by 20 minutes and the women's world record by an hour. The following year, you swam the English Channel again in nine hours and 36 minutes, breaking the record yet again. Lynn, do you love this? You just have to sit here and take it. You were the first (laughs) person to swim the 10 miles around the Cape of Good Hope, located at the southern tip of Africa through shark and sea snake infested waters. And you did that in three hours and three minutes. You were the first person to swim across the Strait of Magellan in 42 degree water through a storm in one hour and two minutes. In 1987, after years of preparation, you achieved a diplomatic first, swimming across the Bering Strait, opening the US Soviet border for the first time in 48 years. You did that in two hours and six minutes in 38 degree water. And in 2002, wearing only a swimsuit, Lynn Cox performed a mile long swim from a boat to the shore of Antarctica in waters of 32 degrees Fahrenheit and Sports Illustrated called you the greatest open water swimmer. Lynn, You did these things. You Ah. conceived of them, which is to say you caught the spark of creative inspiration, and then you actually put in the work and you did these things. This is not leading up to a question. This is just amazing. It's just amazing. And if you would like us to take over for your husband and introducing you at every party, (laughs) we are happy to do so. We're happy to do it. But really, all of these athletic accomplishments, is there one of them that you feel like especially, especially proud of? You know, it, it's sort of like when you have dogs or children, What, who do you like the best in the family? <laughs> it, it's, I don't think you can say that. I, what I really believe, though, is that 
each swim was the most important when I did it. It was the most difficult challenge. And I could not go on to the next thing if I hadn't succeeded at the previous. Uh. That's how I swim. That's how I write books. I build upon what I've done and continue going. I love that. Love it. Love it. If you don't mind, I'd love to read a quote from an interview that you did with Matt Dellinger of the New York Times, because it really captures the moment when you were sparked. Oh, sure. Here's what you said. When the idea of swimming to Antarctica occurred to me, it was one of those aha moments in my life. I knew it was something I wanted to do, something I just had to do. Just thinking about it made me smile. What intrigued me was how it could be done. I didn't know. I didn't think anyone knew. But the fun and creativity came in the trying, the testing, working harder at something than I had ever before. There were so many early explorers who wrote about their experiences of sailing around Antarctica. Cook, Shackleton, so many others, but none of them had the experience of swimming there. Do you remember mm. saying that, Lynn? <laughs> Actually, I do because he asked such great questions. And so when you ask great questions like you both do, it draws people out and makes you think about why you do what you do and how you're inspired to do it. Well, Lynn, when I read that quote, I was so moved by it because I was like, this is it. This is Lynn Cox describing the creative process. A spark of inspiration came to you that only could have come because of the, the things that you had created before. So it stood on the shoulders of those things, but then it made you smile. You got this visceral feeling in your body that said, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And I don't know if anybody in the world could tell me, but I'm going to take step by step by step. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to piece it together with my vision and my team. I was just so struck by the way that you summarize the creative process. And we're also struck by the way that you have married creativity to your swimming. Mm -hmm. And we're curious when these sparks of inspiration, when do they typically come to you? Do you seek them out actively? Do you wait to see how the muse strikes you? You've also spent 10 million hours in open water. And I wonder if sparks come to you when you swim. <laughs> Actually, that's exactly what happens when I'm swimming. I'm thinking about my life. It's, it's, it's a great think tank. You know, there's, there's no outside input unless you want it. You just hear the bubbles of your breath and the, oh. the sound of your hands and, and feet moving through the water. And so there's this rhythm, there's this relaxation. Even if you're working hard, there's a rhythm and relaxation and, and you can let your mind travel. And so on those days when I really deep thought I was swimming kind of close to shore so I don't get run over by boats. But um, I actually each day think about what am I doing in my life? What what do I want to do? How do I get from here to there? And I think the other part that helps help me so much in my life is that my mom and dad were so different. My dad was a physician, a science person. My mom was a mom, but she was an artist and she studied art from the time she was four years old on her grandfather's lap, who was an artist, a painter. And uh. her whole side of her family on her mom's side were all artists and creators. So I used to see my mom get out her palette and decide that she was going to paint the wall. So she'd do a New England scene and paint the entire living room wall with a New England scene. And a friend would come over and, and a guy named Greg and say, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen, but it's so great. And I just thought, you know, I just thought this is what moms do. <laughs> they just decide they want yeah. to do something and they do it. Yeah. And then my dad was the opposite of before you do something, you do all of the research, you do all the background, you learn as much as you can by reading, by talking to people, by going there, and you and you put it all together. So to have art and science before me, and to be able to pull it together and see it in my life, it has had such a great way of helping me figure out how to be creative and also not just creative, but complete my creativity, you know, that I'll complete a book, I'll complete a swim. Yes. Yes. Oh, this yeah. is interesting. I'm going <laughs> to tell our listeners a couple of things and then return to that very spot right there. Just so everyone knows, Lynn, you know, you're well aware of this, but you have written several books, Swimming in the Sink, a memoir, South with the Sun, Swimming to Antarctica, 
a children's book entitled Elizabeth, Queen of the Seas, Grayson, about that baby whale that we love so much, and your latest book, Tales of Al, The Water Rescue Dog, which we'll talk about more in a moment. But before we do, here are the questions on every writer's mind who's listening. How do you get so much written? What is your approach to writing? And I also want to tack on, and what do you think that combo of art and science and process for your your mom and dad's process, how do you think that has affected your writing process? I think that the reason I've been able to be productive and to see completions of different projects is because I swim in the morning. Uh huh. I think about what I'm writing for the two hours beforehand or three hours, come out of the water, and then I start writing. And then actually on the most recent book, I was so excited about working on it that I was wide awake at three in the morning thinking about it. So I thought, I'm just going to get up and write. So I would start writing for for three or four hours. Then I do my swim thinking about what I've been writing. And then I go back and write for three or four more hours. But the time wasn't time. It was just, I wasn't aware of the time because I was so immersed in thinking about how to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I loved doing that. You know, during the pandemic, Pam, people were, it was a lot of hardship for a lot of people. But for me, we were home for almost two years. And I was, I wrote three books during that time. Um, because we weren't, my husband and I weren't traveling around for his work and I was able to just focus. So for me, it was this great time of creativity. And so, you know, I think that that has helped me because now I've, I've created these, this different work and I'm out there about to start talking about it to people all over the United States. Do you want to start by telling us about it? Can you tell us more about Tales of Al? Yes, I can. Actually, what happened was a friend told me about these dogs in Italy that are trained to leap from helicopters <gasps> into oceans and seas and lakes around Italy and oh rescue my them. Gosh. So oh my God. I just thought, how do you train a dog to leap from a helicopter? And so anyway, I I went online and I saw these videos about the Italian water rescue dogs. And I saw a Newfoundland, one of the giant black furry dogs, leaping out of a helicopter and landing in the ocean. And I just thought, or a lake, it was a lake. So I decided I have to go there and find out more. Oh my gosh, (laughs) of course. Kindred spirits though. These dogs are kindred spirits with you, Lynn Cox. Yes, yes. Because, but I also was thinking, you know, how did they train them and how risky was it for the dogs and for the humans? And do the dogs want to do this? Are they being forced into doing it? Mm -hmm. So I made all sorts of contacts and wound up going to Italy to try to find out more about the dogs. But through this journey, there were stories that came to me about dogs and swimming and learning to swim and being an Italian and in Italy and eating Italian food and being (laughs) in families and all these stories. So this, this book is a story about this one dog named Al who was rambunctious and really not getting it, really not (laughs) learning the role that she was supposed to play, according to the people that were working with her. But it's also a story about love and courage and belief and creativity and hope that things will go a certain way. Oh, I can't wait. And when is it out? When can we get our hands on it? Is it out now? It will come out on May 24th. The launch date. And my husband, Stephen, and I are going to be traveling to 27 cities <gasps> from May until the middle of July, and then a break. And then I'm speaking in Europe and doing some television there. And then I'm coming back and doing more. Oh, fantastic. It's really, really, really exciting. So exciting. I mean, there's nothing better than meeting your readers. Everyone has their own experience and they bring that to whatever they've read that you've written. So you learn so much, you know? And I bet you get even more sparks too. Yes. If you listen, you listen to stories of others, you're like, hey, that's interesting. Yes. Or you learn something that you'll meet somebody else and you can share like, oh, you might want to be in touch with that person because they know how to do this, you know, and and it it just connects people in a really great way. Oh, I love it. 
I, I just have to draw everyone's attention to the way Lynn talked about that creative process where you caught a spark about these dogs that are trained to do these extraordinary things. And you started researching and talking to people and you created something where nothing existed before. And it sounds like it was it actually continues to be a very satisfying creative process that, as you just said, will continue all the way to sharing the light of the work that you made, not only completing the book, but then going out and sharing it with folks. And it is just our dream for people. It's our ideal for people that they are able to take it all the way from that spark of an idea that came from a conversation that you were having with somebody all the way to these adventures that you're creating for yourself, a book tour, you know, going to Europe and meeting your readers, etc. So I just wanted to have underscored the possibility of that. It's not just possible for Lynn Cox. It's not just possible for Lauren Susan. It's possible for for people who are listening to this. Mm -hmm. And I also just want to say, if you have not heard Lynn speak, well, you're hearing her now, of course, but if you (laughs) haven't had a chance to read her work, it is stunningly beautiful. Lynn, I'm just going to butter your bread for a second. The way that you write, the way that you take these experiences that you've had and then spin them into language is gorgeous and super bonus. I find your voice to be so pleasing. So I would like to highly recommend and endorse a Lynn Cox audiobook. Audiobook. It is mm. delicious. And I think mm, I, mm, I may have mm. talked about that when we shared the Grace and Spark on the podcast back in 2019 or whatever that was. Mm-hmm. It is the whole package. It is so satisfying. Again, no question. Just compliments. <laughs> but I will say, as an author and a speaker, you're also like a documentarian. You go to places that many of us physically would not be able to go, like swimming through sea snake infested waters. Then you report back this with this beautiful storytelling. Many athletes have experiences that are extraordinary, but does the storytelling, does the writing and the storytelling complete that process for you? So it's not just that you swam the channel in record-breaking time or that you swam a first or a diplomatic swim, but it's the writing about it that also is integral to your process. Actually, I had always wanted to be a writer because I was such an avid reader. So as a kid, I knew that's what I wanted to be. So part of my love of doing these swims is to be able to share them. I mean, so great you did the English Channel, but what did it feel like? What did it look uh, like? What did you, what happened? What was going on internally? So those were the sparks that helped me figure out how to write it. But I also had a really good friend who was an F-4 pilot in Vietnam. He flew fighter jets and had to land at night on carriers and had to make sure that the tail hook of the airplane caught the cable. Oh the my ship gosh. So he wouldn't go off overboard. And he had to fly with not enough fuel and with wings shot up and they had to wear poopy suits, which were super Suits that were like wetsuits that would squeeze their blood back from their legs back throughout their body so they wouldn't wow. gray out and black out during their missions because of all the G-forces and stuff like that the body goes through. Wow. So we would talk about his experiences and we talk about my experiences. And he said something that stuck with me. I love to learn from people. And then he said, you know, what your challenge is, is to take your experience at and my experience, and make it relatable to people. Yeah. For people who have never done these things, how do you immerse them in it? How do you have them feel what you felt? And one of the biggest compliments I ever had when a friend was reading Swimming to Antarctica, she said, I had to wrap an afghan around myself to be warm. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Because it was so cold when I was reading about your swim. Yes. So I just thought, okay, that's, that's it. To be able to carry somebody into your world through words is fantastic you know and to have them then go you know this helps me figure out how to describe what I'm feeling or thinking gosh you know that's that's great I love it I love that you have built this life as an athlete and a writer like so many people in some of the performing arts, like there's a separation between like anything sort of sporty sports and arts related. It's like, oh, there's so much to learn. And there's so many interesting ways they can be combined. And just listening to you talk about, yes, the creativity of planning a swim 
executing the swim, then writing about and sharing the light, what we call sharing the light, which is like sharing it out to the world so we can all experience it. You have, I mean, dare I say, like perfected this this creativity cycle. <laughs> I just feel like we all have lots to learn from that. Well, I think it's really because the discipline that I learned from being an athlete that I was able to become a writer. Mm -hmm. So that the sensibility of, I have two hours in the morning to work out and two hours in the evening to work out. That was my routine all through yeah. high school, college, and then after. And it's not as long now at this point in my life, but just having a structure and then being able to use that as a framework for my day and know there are certain things that I need to achieve during that time yeah. and setting a time like I'm going to have three a block of three hours today to write. Nothing else gets in that way because I want to move forward. And you stick to it. Yeah, I want to stick to it. I want to see it through. That's that real like mental discipline that like we often think of that athletes have like uh, just self-discipline in that way. I made this commitment. I'm doing this. I don't feel like working out, but I'm going to work out. Do you have any like advice for the rest of us, like mere mortals that we could apply to strengthen our mental game? Is there a trick to it? I think sometimes it's just showing up. I mean, mm. often it's like, ah, it's cold and I don't really feel like swimming this morning. The water's 50 degrees and it's kind of windy. And I, wow, it's just so nice being in bed <laughs> and I want to <laughs> sleep longer. And then you go, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And I, then you get in the water and you think, once you start swimming, why did it take such an effort to get here? It's yes. so good. So I think that's the same thing with the creative process of sitting down, just getting to the computer and sitting down and writing and thinking. Yes. And once you're there, you're in that space to, to begin. And, you know, it doesn't always go easy. I mean, I wrote the book Swimming in the Sink, and that was the antithesis of Swimming to Antarctica. Swimming to Antarctica was about having enormous life goals and swimming and doing these challenges nobody had done. And the other book was about, you know, being so sick, I could hardly walk across the room. Mm. My heart wasn't working anymore. And I there was consideration of my having a heart transplant. Wow. So to then work through that and recover my health and get to the other side, but to then sit down and write about some of this in this book, it was the hardest thing I've ever done as a writer because I had to go back through some of the most difficult times of my life to be this incredible athlete. And then suddenly I can't, mm. I can't get in the water, you know, and, and all I can do to feel like I'm in the water is to put on my cap and goggles and put my hands in the kitchen sink and mm. move them to try to recreate what it's to be back in the ocean again. What, what, you're, what you're illustrating, it sounds uh, harrowing, and we're happy that you're on the other side of it. And it's also, mm -hmm. I have this hypothesis brewing, Lynn, about you, and I think it may be applicable to others, which is the combination of physical activity, physical exertion, and your creative flow seems intrinsically linked, that there's something about the, the ways that you are, when you're swimming, you're swimming, and you're also, you're processing, and you're asking yourself questions, big life questions, and questions about what you want to make in the world. And then when you return to your desk, you are flowing, your self-expression is flowing. And it just seems, I don't know what you think about the hypothesis, but it seems like there's there's a link for you there. There's a huge link, but I think part of it too is one of my favorite poets is Robert Frost. Mm. And I just love his work. And so I remember reading that he used to go for long walks and think about yes. how he would write his poetry. And then, I mean, the next step was I read all of his work and then one day I found a recording of him reading his own work. And it was just like Ooh. going to the next level yes. of hearing the pauses, hearing the raspiness of his voice, hearing the depth and the fluctuation, all of those things. It brought these poems to another level of life. And it was fantastic. So I think that having that ability to move, to not be stuck in one place helps your mind flow. But I also physiologically think that you're bringing more oxygen into your body and moving yeah. it and flowing it. And so I think that, you know, often my husband is an 
semi-professional opera singer. He plays classical piano. He oh. is incredibly creative. He has a, both a financial brain and a musical brain. The best. Which also goes together. But often he'll, he'll say, oh, I just am stuck on something. And he'll go out for a walk and he'll come back yes. and say, I solved it. Yeah. I figured it out. I figured out what the process is to do this. And I think that getting stuck is you're also physically stuck in a place. And if you can just move mm -hmm. and not just move constantly to stay away and avoid what you're doing, but to move and think about it in a relaxed way, I think you can come back to it and revisit it and come back with fresh ideas. And for me, it's not always, I mean, the beginnings of my books, often I write the beginning of my book 50, 60, 120 times before I get the first page the way I want it. And then from there, I can start writing the story. Yeah. But until I get those first paragraphs, it's just not right. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I just love, we've talked a lot. I also love taking a long walk and I'll think of it sometimes as literally that, like I'm shaking it loose. I'm shaking the, there's ideas now. I'm just like, like change in my pocket, shaking them loose where they had been kind of calcified and the oxygen in the body, the, the new stimulus, the nature. I just, yes, I'm 100% with you on that. Lynn I also am struck by when you were talking about listening to Robert Frost read his own work, that's how we feel about listening to you read your own work. <laughs> the natural, the way that you reflect on nature in your work and the sound of your voice, which again is just so delicious. So oh, this, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now I'll be really self-conscious. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Uh, you're our Robert Frost. Um, Lynn, just taking a, a little bit of a left turn, we are endlessly fascinated by the topic of failure or perceived failure. For somebody like you who is so accomplished, can you tell us and our listeners about something creative that you attempted, that you perceived as a failure, and how you process that, what you learned from it, and how you um, continued on? I think that... There's two different levels. There's the swimming one where I tried to swim across the Catalina Channel and I got lost at midnight mm. and separated from the boats. And it took 45 minutes to an hour. I don't know how much to finally find the paddler on the paddleboard and me Wow! and get back. And after that swim, I decided I never, ever, ever wanted to do an open water swim again. <gasps> and I was, I was at that time 17 years old. Oh, wow. And so... I was so fortunate, though, because there was a friend named Fami Atala who was a school psychologist who had tried to swim the English Channel four times, and he'd gotten within 400 meters ashore, and he was pulled out of the water because his crew thought he'd gone into hypothermia. Oh. And it turns out that King Farouk was standing on shore in Dover, <gasps> England, waiting for him to, to land. Oh. And so afterwards he said, Fami, it broke my heart that you didn't finish the swim. And Fami said, you know, it broke my heart too. Yeah, no <laughs> yes. kidding. But Fami Oof. was on my swim when I was lost in the fog. And so he talked to me and basically said, you have the ability to break the world record. You have to go back again and try again. And my parents did the same thing where they said, you really need to not give up now. You need to fulfill this commitment. And I think that was the first and only time that I felt like my parents were really pushing me. Up until then, I, they'd always supported me, which was a big difference. And so the other thing, though, besides that, was that my brother held the world record from Catalina Island to the mainland. And I think deep inside it bothered me that I would break his world record if I swam from Catalina Island to the mainland. So wow. we decided to switch it around and I would start the swim from the mainland of Catalina, I mean, mainland of California, and swim to Catalina Island so that if I broke a record, it wouldn't be his record. It wasn't taking it from him. Wow. Right. So I wound up going back. <laughs> And swimming and doing the fastest overall swim for anyone for the Catalina Channel. And I look at that now and go, you know what? I was really right to have my family push me. It was really important to have them say, don't give up on your goals. Don't give up on yourself. Mm -hmm. This was a bad situation. Revisit it. 
That really, really helped. In my writing career, you know, I've done speeches where I've flubbed up and I, you know, instead of looking at the speech with success, I look at the flub ups and uh-huh. I try to figure out how can I do it better? How can I not stumble next time? Mm-hmm. Working on, actually, I was told don't practice, don't practice, but I don't like to do things that I'm not prepared for. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be ready. So right now I'm reading Tales of Al the Water Rescue Dog over and over again out loud. Yeah. Because I'm going to be doing the audio version of it. Yes. And my my husband, Stephen Bronfenbrenner, taught me that, you know, he sings opera. So he has learned all these different words that you have to sing in French and Italian and, and even in Russian and Czech. And so he said, you know, what you need to do before you read this book, because you've written words in Italian, go to the audio dictionary and learn the Italian words so they become just fluent for you. So I started that two months ago. And at the end of this month, I'll do the recording. But I've been constantly working on it because this is not my world. And I'm not a musician, but he is. And so I've learned from him that they just practice and they practice and practice until it's smooth. Yeah. So it, it really helps me having his creative influence in my life to be able to make sure that I don't do a big faux pas. Well, I, I love his, his advice is so good, though, because by just slow and steady practicing those Italian words and phrases, when you are actually in the booth recording the audiobook, you can really focus on your self-expression, connecting with your listeners, and enjoyment instead of being pulled out by fear that you are going to mispronounce a word, which can really like harsh your afternoon. It just robs you of the the pleasure of getting to record that audiobook. I totally did it. I understand it because I did an audio version of Grayson. And mm-hmm. just because it was my work didn't mean that I really knew how to read it because I wasn't a professional. But I think that it really would have been better had I done what I'm doing now. Read the book through. If there's anything that's bumpy, read that sentence over and over mm-hmm. again until it's smooth so that when I actually do this, because the other thing is that my work has been edited a little bit. So instead of sometimes instead of saying a, word, a person's name, it will be a pronoun, she or he. So in my mind, it should be the person's name, but in the reading of it, it's changed to a she or he. So I will start to stumble when I'm reading it. Uh-huh. So I have to like, ah, I, I mean, I'm sure you've experienced this in, in doing what you're doing, that you, if you have somebody editing your work, you, you have to then go with those edits when you're speaking it. And mm-hmm. it's, it's challenging. Um, but mm-hmm. that's what's great and fun because you learn something new. And you can do something else that way. Yes. You know? Yes to all of that. I keep thinking about like, wow, you have some really fantastic people around you giving you sound advice. Yes. I mean, your your family you were born into, but that like pushing you to not leave it here unfinished, but actually keep keep going on this goal. And then your husband with the ideas of like practice these things, like you really have surrounded yourself with people giving you very sound and very supportive advice. Like I'm, I want to kind of be adopted. Is that okay? <laughs> like, can I just join you? <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. No, the thing is, I think that for people who are creative, when they're not going a mean, mainstream life, they need people to support and believe in them. I mean, the stuff I've done in my life hasn't been normal. It really hasn't been normal. And so it's been really hard to be out there doing things that are really different. And so yeah. to have people say, that's super cool. Not to say, why are you doing that? Oh, yes. I mean- <laughs> Lynn Cox, We this is the drum that we bang ceaselessly, which is, I think you're a game changer. I think yeah. you are a trailblazer. And that means that there is no map. That means that you are drawing the map and then you are following the map that you have drawn. And I think having people around you, smart, creative people don't go it alone. Having people around you, uh, was it Famiatella, like supporting that vision and also reminding you when it's sort of like, this is not the end of the story. The story is going to continue on and you are going to process through your fears about what it means to swim at night, what it means to swim in open water, et cetera. It's just amazing. It's so much of your distinct game-changing creative life is a great object lesson for all of us about what is 
possible because it may be something you have never seen before. Mm -hmm. And if you think that you'll get there by looking around to see like, well, what's everyone else doing? You don't have that option. There's not like, uh, let me just check with everybody else. You have like, here is the vision in my mind and let me figure out how I'm going to do that. There may be some people who come along on this ride with me, but it's singular. It's, it's really, really interesting. But smart to have folks who say, how are we going to get there? Not, you're going to do what now? Exactly. Critical. Absolutely critical. But there's also a lot of collaboration. I had no yes. idea when I wrote my first book that it was all about, you know, the interior design of the book, the book cover that was yeah. designed by an illustrator, the the people that would be figuring out how to get the book out to readers, the, the editor that would be saying, you know, maybe you want to emphasize that a little bit more or you're redundant here. All of those things make the book the book and it's never really alone. But to be able to reach, I mean, swimming to Antarctica took me 21 years to find a publisher. Wow. And then another year to get it accepted and printed. And so, you know, that was my longest swim. You know, yeah. I, all my life, I wanted to be a writer. And so to keep trying and trying and trying and get rejected and rejected and finally get it to a point where somebody would look at it and then be excited about it. And then I was able to get, by then I'd done the swim in Antarctica and I was able mm -hmm. to get people in the writing world from the New Yorker and the New York times that were endorsing my, my writing. Mm -hmm. And so that helped me get to that next level. And then the people at Knopf believed in me and that has made such a difference because once I had written my first book and it became an, a bestseller, then my next book, instead of 21 oh, sure. years, it took me eight months to write it. Right. Right, you know, and then right. the next book was a year. And then so it was there was this momentum that started to be created. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is so important to be able to surround yourself with champions, yeah. but not yes. narrow minded champions. Correct. People that are thinking yes. in a big way, because if I only I love swimmers, but if I only surrounded myself with swimmers, that would be the only thing I talked about. So That's I love right. to be around musicians and artists yes. and, and people that are doing things that are politically groundbreaking yes. things that are new thought. And, and that's why I love working with my book agent, Martha Kaplan, because she will only work on projects that are bringing new ideas into being. Oh, you know, she, uh, she is not about bringing negativity into the world. And yes. so I think that that's the other thing of when you have people around you that are drawing you down, that are holding you up, that are setting you back, like an athlete, you learn, do not stick around that group. It's time yes. to move and find people that will support you, that you in turn can support, and that yes. will make your life so much better. Oh, Lynn. You know? Amen. Amen. Preach, Lynn yeah. Cox. Preach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> no, it's sorry, cool. But, it's no. perfection. It's yeah. perfection. We're all about that. We believe that in, in any creative endeavor, you've got to be surrounded by the people that will lift you up, that will say, oh, wow, what an interesting vision. I never would conceive of that. Let's figure out how how to make that happen. How can we bring that to life? Yeah, like how do you do that? It's for them to question, not in a negative way, but in a question of That's right. what is going to be your process? How are you going to reach out? Who do you know? And so for yeah. me, my world is all about connections with other people. And so yeah. I look at, I can read a lot. I can learn a lot. I can listen to recordings I can yeah. but I think that for me I look at the world as people around the world that you connect with the local experience people know more than you'll ever know so to be able to tap into local people and say okay we're going to do a book signing in St. Paul Minnesota where would be the best place? How do you, you know, not to just go in thinking, I know anything. I know everything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a big difference by, by who you recruit to help you achieve your vision, but also realize that they are part of that and what are their rewards for helping you achieve your vision. Because I think that that, for me, when I was doing the swim in Antarctica, I had three physician friends that went with me. 
to make sure that when I jumped into the water that I didn't go into cardiac arrest. But if I did, they would know what to do because the water was 32 degrees and I was wearing a swimsuit cap and goggles. Yeah. And so I'd never been in water that cold. Wow. And there's something called sudden death syndrome where you can jump into cold water and your heart will just stop. So I had to have the confidence that the, this group of physicians would know what to do at that moment. But they also knew that they were so important to making the swim real. That's right. Because without them, I wouldn't have done it. They were essential. Them. And then the, the support crew in the Zodiac boats, the guy in the dry suit ready to pull me out if there was a problem, people watching for leopard seals and, and icebergs. All of these people played the incredible role of getting me across. So, yeah, you are a solo swimmer. If you don't make it across, you didn't achieve it. But you really aren't doing it alone. You really are relying on people. Ah, uh, yeah. But if you did make it across, it's thanks to a whole group of people. A whole lot of people. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that's sort of the life journey. You know, if you, if, but also, I think also, sometimes I've had people that, like when I swam the English Channel for the first time, when I was 15 years old, there was a cab driver who was driving my mom and me to Shakespeare Beach, where I was going to start to swim. And he looked at me and said, you're too fat to be a channel swimmer. What? So I looked at him like, what do you know? And and I've trained all my life at that point, 15 years old, to do this swim. And so during the swim, I'm thinking, he's wrong. He's wrong. He's wrong. <laughs> you used it as fuel. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, that's wonderful. You can use the negativity to feed that spark that you have. Yes. God, it's great. It's great. Yes, it's great. Indeed. Yeah. Then is there something in particular that you're proud of or that you love that you don't get asked about often, that you don't get to talk about often that you want to share with us? Does anything come to mind? I think that, you know, I think that I just have an ordinary day, everydayness in my life. I mean, it sounds like I'm always going for these, you know, more schools, <laughs> but, but I'm not. Now, I mean, life for me now is about getting up in the morning and swimming with a couple friends and then talking to them about what they're doing in their lives and their days and their families, and then going and, and doing whatever writing I'm working on. And then spending time with my husband and sharing in the travels that we're doing for his work and for mine. So I think that, you know, I, I was so lucky that I met Stephen Braun from Brenner seven years ago and instantly fell in love with him and now we're married. And so our lives together have been this incredible journey for the last seven years. And I feel uh. so fortunate because I never thought at this point in my life, I would meet somebody. I wouldn't meet him, the man that I'd always hoped for. Uh, and so, you know, to be with somebody who's creative and thoughtful and kind and who wants to travel with me and support me when I'm doing my stuff and I want to be there for him. Oh. It's, it's an incredible part of life, you know, and who would have thought? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. And again, I feel like you have had really good taste in the people that you have uh, surrounded yourself with and partnered with. And it, it just sounds like a wonderful life. The mundane parts and the thrilling parts all sound fantastic. It's just great. Yeah. I mean, how many times do you have your husband say, I want to, yeah, I'll go grocery shopping with you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> sure. Or you want to make a menu? I'll help you figure out what we're going to yes. have for dinner. Do you want me to, I can cook tonight. I'm like, okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. Good catch. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing though, because sometimes, you know, I have friends that are, are my age that are kind of like, haven't met the right man or was disappointed or whatever. And they sort of go seeing you so happy makes me hope that this will happen too. So I keep asking Stephen, do you have any good friends? <laughs> <laughs> Twins, <laughs> brothers. Yes. Are there more of you? Because yeah. you know that there's a circle of friends and people like, yes. things alike, you know, that, you know, if you're around good people, they attract really good people. There's something in what you're saying, too, about uh, when we talk, I think, especially to young artists, sometimes they can have a singular vision about the things that they want to accomplish in life. And I think that's probably a hallmark of youth in a certain way, that sort of singular ambition towards things. And just trying to gently share the possibility with them that a happy whole life includes Yes, like being a trailblazer and yes, being creatively self-expressed and yes, potentially finding someone that you enjoy going to the grocery store with or enjoying spending time on your own decorating cakes, like it, a whole life 
is a full life. So I think that's a beautiful illustration of that, Lynn. And I'm happy for you. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. And for him. And yeah. for him. <laughs> Lynn, is there a creative thing you absolutely need to do before you're done? Wow. Uh, no, I don't know that because I still have to do what I'm doing now to figure out what's next. <laughs> yeah. It all stands on the shoulders of the thing you're doing now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think also, though, I think the biggest part of creativity for me is to do to work on something that excites me. And so, you know, I absolutely love dogs. And so to be able <laughs> to write a book about dogs and then to meet people that have dogs and to be I mean, the swimmer community are so ebullient and excited and high energy, but there's the same connection with people that have dogs. That's right. So I'm thinking that when I'm doing this book tour through 27 different cities, you know, in May through July, I'm going to be meeting people that are, are sharing stories about swimming and about dogs. And I can't wait, you know, because I think that the part of being creative is about being enthralled with an idea and then having all sorts of stimulation around it that mm -hmm. makes you think more about it in different, different ways. And then eventually you sort of hone in on what is it that you really want to say about it or create about it or e expand on for people. And so for me, telling this new story, Tales of Al, the Water Rescue Dog, it was, it's a story about dogs, but it's also a story about Italian cooking and food. I love, uh -huh. I love food. So there's these combinations of different worlds that I've been able to write about that. How much fun is that? So now you understand why I was getting up at three in the morning. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. let me write some more. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Oh. Yeah. And I think that that confidence though has come through time that you know when I wrote my first book you know and to get I mean 21 years of rejections I, I went to New York six times I I tried to reach out to so many different people my manuscript was never looked at and it was only through a contact that somebody believed in my writing that then showed it to Vicki Wilson my editor at Knopf who then said I like it very much. Here's the name of two agents. You need an agent. And so I interviewed the agents and chose Martha Kaplan. And then suddenly I had people that believed in me. Building that team. But 21 years. 21 years. It's a good thing you're an endurance swimmer because it comes in handy when you need to be an endurance creative. And please, friends, hear what Lynn Cox is saying to you that just if something doesn't happen immediately, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It may mean that you need to continue putting one foot in front of the other tenacity, endurance. One of my best friends is a fashion designer. And so she taught me that she could design this beautiful top and put it out for sale and it wouldn't sell this week. Six months later, the top they couldn't keep enough in the stores. So it was just all about timing too. Yes. And so she was often saying, just try again, do another way. It's just this timing and it's the right person. And so that's what happened with her. I mean, she was one of the most, she is one of the most creative people that I've ever known that, you know, to have a line after line of closing go, go out and to be able to look at other people's work in, in the clothing world and then to upgrade it or change it slightly to make it her design. I mean, I can go into a store and go, that's yours. Oh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's right. It's a signature. Um, yeah. And so, you know, Deborah Ford is her name and she, she's Australian and she started off in Australia designing clothes and then wound up coming to the United States and then expanding her world from there. Um, now she's back in Australia designing. So and I think that it's fabulous to be able to have people that are around you that are willing to to inspire you, to help you do the things you want to do. And you in turn do the same for them. Amen. Yeah. 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 That's great. Lynn, here's a question that we ask all of our guests. You work really hard. What's it all for? It's for my life. It's oh, for my life. Yes. I would be so bored if I just did normal stuff all the time. I mean, I think to have something that excites you and makes you reach and believe in yourself and pushes you and gives you something to say, I am living a life. I yes. am here. I am alive. It's, it's not about climbing the mountain. It's enjoying the entire journey yes. and realizing that sometimes things are good and sometimes things are bad. But if you just keep 
moving forward, you keep getting there. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Lynn Cox. We appreciate you. Lynn Cox, you are a gem. Friends, check out uh, really any of Lynn's writing. You can read it. You can audio book it. It's so delicious. Tales of Al, the water rescue dog coming soon. Attend one of those book signings yeah. on Lynn's upcoming book tour. You will not regret it. Lynn, thank you so much. I guess that's it. This episode of The Spark File was made on the lands of the Lenape people. We hope we put a bunch of sparks in your file. Listen, if there's a spark you'd like us to explore, or you've taken a spark and fanned it into a creative flame, and you'd like to share that, email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We'll even take your feedback, but you know the price of admission. First, you got to share a creative risk that you have taken recently. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Wherever you get this podcast, subscribe, rate, five-star review it. If you like it, share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, I don't know, Lynn, what do you say to your critics? You know, my critics are often people that are reading the book and they'll say something about they didn't like about it. And I think, you know what? I'm really sorry, but I can't change it because it's already been completed. <laughs> That's right. And it, but, it, but it does bother me. And I just think, well, maybe there's something within that I need to consider. But often it's, I can't do anything about it. Actually, a good friend, Arthur Golden, who wrote Memoirs of a Geisha, Mm -hmm. uh, I asked him, did he ever get criticism on that book? And he just looked at me like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I said, so what did you do? And he said, well, you know, it's like slamming your finger in the car door. <laughs> it hurts like heck. And then you take it out of the car door and over the next week or two, you keep fingering it and it hurts. So stop fingering it. <laughs> stop uh, squeezing your finger. Yes. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Let it go. Let it go. You can't, can't do anything about it. So go on. Let it go. But I love what you said about like, is there anything that I can learn from it and maybe incorporate into the future? This is done, but maybe for the future. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right, friends. If something tickles your fancy and gets your creative juices flowing, we are writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that's been knocking at your door. It's your turn to take a spark and fan it into a flame. You know, you got to take it and make it. Bye. Bye, Thanks, Lynn Cox. Lynn. Bye. We love you. We love you too. <laughs> you I bump into something that inspires me. I dump it in my spark files. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark file. I jump into my spark file. Let's open up the spark file. Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from the Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for the Spark File Illume, a nine month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in a loom, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap take a risk, go to thesparkfile.com slash illum and join us for illum. Illume.